So um, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone to this Health Foundation webinar. My name is Jennifer Dixon and I'm pleased to be your chair today. Um, we have a very big subject to chew over. Um, what last week's spending review means for health, the NHS and social care. And I'm really delighted to say that we have three extremely expert guests to help us chew the cud on this. Guests who I'll introduce in a second. So clearly we're living in extremely unusual times. The economy, our health, the NHS and the social care system are currently being battered directly or indirectly due to the pandemic. And the same probably is true for government, isn't it? Um, this is all showing up um, longer term weaknesses that we knew we were there, but can now be seen more clearly. Weaknesses in our economy, in our health with existing inequalities widening, the NHS, our lack of preparedness, workforce shortages, lack of capital investment as well. And in our social care system, we have chronic underinvestment and major reform ducked by successive governments. But we've also seen significant strengths too in the way the country has responded. We've learned a lot. There are opportunities ahead. Can we build back better? So last week we had the Office for Budget, uh, Budget Responsibilities Economic and Fiscal Outlook to 25-26 and we also had the government's spending review. And so what we want to do today is look in particular at the spending review and consider the implications for health, which includes levelling up. We also want to consider the implications for the NHS and social care. Does the spending review address the key issues? If not really, what's the likely room for manoeuvre over the next couple of years, given the economy? And what should the government do as a priority? So to chew the card on all of this, I'm truly delighted to introduce our very knowledgeable and experienced panel. We have Professor Jajit Chadra, who is the director of the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, or NISA. This is, um, I found out, uh, Jajit is Britain's longest established independent research institute, founded in 1938. We also have Chris Giles, who is well known to many of you. He is the economics editor at the Financial Times. And we also have Anita Charlesworth, our very own Anita, who is a senior economist here at the Health Foundation and director of the Real Centre, which is, stands for Research and Economic Analysis for the Long Term, which is a kind of OBR for health that we've just set up. So well, welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. So first, what I'm going to do is invite each of our three speakers to make some opening remarks on the spending review and its possible implications for health, the NHS and social care from their particular perspective. I'm going to ask them to speak for about five minutes each before we head into a wider discussion. Now in the discussion, just use the uh, Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen to enter your question. And if you, when you do that, could you just say if you would like to where you are speaking from um, so that we know a little bit more about you. And if you like someone's question that you see that they've entered, you can upload it by stick clicking on the thumbs up icon by the question in the chat function. So what we'll do is try and answer as many as we can in the hour that we've got. And thank you to those of you who've already submitted questions. Don't worry, we've got all of those and I've got them right in front of me here. So um, finally, before we get going, just to say there's a few relevant publications you might like that the, pub that the um, foundation has published. What we'll do is put those into the chat box during the webinar and show it on the slide at the end so you can take a look if you want to at leisure. So with all of that, I'm now going to turn to our three speakers for their opening remarks and thought we'd first start with Chris, who might give us a few contours of the wider economic picture and the spending review from last week. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. What I'll do is I'll outline what the OBR said was the economic situation that the UK faces at the moment. I might say a few things and put it into a slightly wider context and say a few things the OBR as a independent but official body probably can't say itself and uh, then look at the public finances and say a little bit about inequalities and social care but I'll leave health uh, particular, uh, especially to Anita. So just the big picture we hear a lot about so we hear a lot about a trade-off between lives and livelihoods but I think we should really recognize that the economics says that uh, very much the particularly difficult economic situation that we're in at the moment 
is because of the virus. It's not because of the lockdown. The lockdown is the proximate cause, but the ultimate cause is the virus. So the virus happened and then we've had to respond as a nation and we are not alone in this. This has happened all over the world. And I'll talk a little bit about the international picture in a second. But just to say, where is the UK? Well, the OBR's forecast in the spending review last week suggests we're in a pretty difficult situation. If the economy fell by about 6%, that's the output of everything, the value of goods and services produced in the UK fell by about 6% in the financial crisis just over a decade ago. From peak to trough in the COVID crisis, it fell by 25%, so four times worse. Now, luckily that fall was very quick in March and April, and the recovery has been very rapid since then. But we are still 10% below where we were in February in the, in the economy. Uh, and that is an extraordinarily large amount. In, not, in often in recessions in the 80s and the 90s, we talked about peak to trough falls of about two and a half to 4% in the economy. We thought the financial crisis was enormous at 6%. So being 10% below is really very large still. Uh, what does it mean? I mean, it's the largest in 300 years. You will have heard that stat banded around. Where we haven't seen much impact has been on unemployment yet. It's gone from three, just under 4% to just under 5% so far, likely to rise to about just over 7 to 8% once the support, the government support for furlough winds down in the spring next year. So that's the re we've seen a lot of government support to keep people attached to their jobs. That doesn't mean the underlying labour market is as healthy. Uh, so there's likely to be a rise in unemployment to come. And the extraordinary amounts of uh, government support for companies and for households, to, which happened extremely quickly in the crisis, means that the public, the real strain of this recession has been felt hardest on the public finances. So while we saw a deficit of 150 billion pounds at the worst point of the global financial crisis, uh, which was about 10% of the economy uh, a decade ago, this time around we're talking about just shy of 400 billion pounds this year. So more, more than twice as bad, about 20%, 19% of the economy. That is an extraordinarily large amount of money. Uh, the good news is we don't expect it to last at that sort of level for more than one year. We expect it to recover again quite quickly. Just very quickly to put this in an international perspective, this is where the UK doesn't look so good. Now you can sort of excuse the UK a little bit with some measurement issues and there are some measurement issues but I'm not going to go into them here. But I think the big picture is that we have spent much more as a, as a country, as a government on tackling the Covid crisis and yet our economic performance is worse than comparable countries with the maybe notable exceptions of Spain and Argentina. We might not want to be comparing ourselves with them. Uh, and yet our health outcomes have also been worse. Our death rates in the wider context are the worst in the G7. If you look at the numbers of people who have died more than who we'd expected to have died this year, we're at about 80,000 uh, by now. And uh, our economic performance has been worse and our health outcome has been worse. So we have not got at the moment a great record. Perhaps with the vaccine and being quick on that, we might be able to recover some of that in the, in the year or so ahead. But as we stand today, we're not looking very pretty internationally. And all the big international bodies say so. Uh, I'm not too worried about the being 10% below uh, where we were in February. That in, if we recover that next year with the, with the vaccine and with getting back to normal, that would be fine. We can deal with one year, one terrible year. That's exactly what governments are there for. That's why we have government debt. Uh, we would just have more debt and we would service it. We'd never want to pay that back. The worry for the UK economy, it's the worry for all economies, is that we have some persistent and permanent damage from this crisis. The OBR estimated that and it was not much more than a finger in the air estimate at the moment. It's where we really need to do more economic work at about 3% damage. So that's persistent damage that we are going to be 3% worse off than we thought we would have been in February uh, before the pandemic hit. And that's going to persist for a very long time. That is actually pretty optimistic. I mean, that's sort of sick, losing 60 billion pounds of the UK economy forever every year, uh, but that's quite an optimistic 
number. Most recessions have bigger long-term scarring than that. The global financial crisis, we think at the moment would be about 15%. So, so this hopefully will be in some ways the good news. Now, what does that look like, the scarring? Well, it'll be investment that never happened through this year. It'll be capital that's in the wrong place. You know, where do we, where will we work? Will we work at home? And so various capital that's linked to big cities and city centers won't be needed anymore. And so we'll close down. Where do we shop? We've already seen Arcadia and Debenhams go down this week. So th these sorts of things, they, these uh, things persist. If we can't get quickly back to sports venues, concert halls, theaters, etc., you know, we saw that rather bad, the bad cyber advert, which was said there was a ballet dancer called Fatima and said, what will, what, what will she do next? Will her next job be in cyber? Well, if she spent, let's say, 15 years of her life training to be a ballet dancer, and then she has to move that, move from that because of no fault of her own, that is a big loss to the economy and to society. And so that's the sort of thing in practical terms where these scarring effects happen. And it's that scarring effect that ultimately means the, the economy is a little smaller than we would have hoped it would be. Tax revenues are a little lower than we would have hoped. And therefore you get what might be a persistent deficit, which is larger than we hoped and that what we might need to close in, if we need, if we need to go, we'll come back to whether that we do need to close it, but that's where traditionally we'd say we'd need to close that higher than expected persistent deficit. And in the OBR's forecast, it was around 30 billion quid a year, which is, you know, is significant, but smaller than uh, the amount that we had to close after the financial crisis because the scarring effect essentially is smaller. Uh, it would have been 40 billion pounds, but the, while, the, while the government keeps saying there is no austerity and they won't have any austerity, there was actually about 10 billion pounds worth of austerity in the spending review because they, they cut spending plans by about 10 billion pounds a year compared with, with where they were in March. So we already have seen some austerity and it means that spending will not rise as fast as we had thought. I think I'll leave it there for the economy very quickly on inequalities, it's not been an equal crisis. Uh, clearly in the health sector, it's been the old who've died uh, and men who've died, uh, but we often think about only the, the survivors and in the survivors, it's been the opposite. So it's been women, the young and the poor who've been uh, by far the hardest hit. So for the surviving population, we are going to see an in increase in inequality, almost certainly because that's also where the scarring is going to be. Uh, in regional terms, it's actually London that's been hit hardest uh, in, on almost all measures. So that's unusual for the UK. And that's with, the, with the, having the largest city, the largest inner city, that is also going to be a slight change in, our, in the way we think about regions. I think in the years ahead, uh, just one, uh, one comment I'll make on the other aspect of the questions, which was on social care, uh, is that again, we've seen in the spending review uh, a little bit of sticking plaster on the social care situation. No sign yet the government has a long-term solution. A bit of extra money, not coming from central government, but being forced through local authorities on, in higher council tax bills. So they're going to go up by 5% uh, in April next year. So we, we say we haven't heard about tax increases yet, but there are already tax increases planned and that'll be the council tax next year. It's a bit of be a sticking plaster for social care. much Chris. Before I just go to Jadjit, just a very quick question. Clearly this is a very dynamic situation. The OBR, as you say, they have three scenarios, a middle one, a pessimistic one and an optimistic one. How much weight can we put on these projections given the situation is so dynamic and uncertain? Well I think that's a good question Jennifer. Clearly we, we everything is very uncertain. We, I've been looking at the sort of central scenario uh, only, but we know we're not going to hit the central scenario. We know that the range of possibilities is wide, both positive and negative. And I thought the OBR was actually slightly uh, unwise to, in the way it chose its scenarios, it gave a very detailed account of what this meant for vaccines and, and the recovery, when actually what we know is they pulled a number, 3% out of thin air, they pulled a bigger one, 6%, and, a, and one of zero, and then they, ex after the fact, 
told a story about them, which I think is perfectly reasonable, but it wasn't a very scientific process. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. So let's now go to Jajit for some remarks. I mean, even the IMF, Jajit, is talking about fiscal activism at the moment in the light of what Chris is describing as being economic and social scarring. And I know you've written on this recently, so interested to hear your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Chris. And thank you uh, to the Health Foundation for inviting me along uh, this afternoon. It's hard not to start or preface my remarks with the tribute to all of those who've been working in the health sector, social service sector this year. Um, I think it's been a remarkable uh, response to what has been a tragedy across most of the world uh, this year. And I, I think, and um, Jennifer was kind enough to mention the establishment of the National Institute in 1938. And of course, it, a key um, founder of the institute was Beveridge himself who um, said well, what we need is very hard and fast economic analysis to try and improve policy making and I think that's what the institute has tried to do um, and, and I think this crisis illustrated more than anything I can think of in my lifetime uh, which is um, longer than you might think um, the, the, the need for robust and resilient health care and social care to underpin economic performance there's not a long run trade off. Chris mentioned trade offs in his remarks, and I'll come to it again. It's, it's absolutely clear there is no long run trade off. There is, the, the resilience of the health service and the robustness in which we're able to supply um, health care and social care to people over the course of their lifetime is critical to economic performance. And it's been exposed by, by this crisis very clearly to people. And what that then means is, is that. It, I'll come to that a little bit later on in terms of what it means for fiscal policy, but it means we can't really afford not to address the financing in fiscal plans for the health service over the medium to long run. And one of the problems with the spending review we just had is it's, it's a one year spending review. There's also ongoing concern that I have with the way fiscal policy is set. We've had budgets moved around, cancelled, spending reviews foreshortened. And for those of us working in complex industries, and most of the industries in which we now work in this country are ter terribly complex, the kind of pl planning that we need is goes far beyond any one year. So what we definitely need are commitments over a multi-year period so that people can plan accordingly. Now, there's been a lot of talk about trade-offs in terms of if we intervene in the economy, if we use lockdowns or the tiering system to intervene um, in people's normal level of social interactions will that not lead to a reduction in economic activity but it will save lives and the, the sort of crass cost benefits analysis of that tends to suggest by some economists it hasn't been worth it because if you take the kind of quality equivalent of thirty thousand pounds per year to account for the fall in gdp that chris was describing you're generally talking about something like half um, a half a million uh, people being uh, uh, living for 10 years longer in order to get to those kinds of savings. But that doesn't really deal with the other costs in terms of the uncertainty as to the impact that this virus might have on people's health, uh, lives, as well as the uncertainty of not knowing when lockdowns or other forms of stringency may be introduced, which leads to shortening of planning horizons. Firms will defer investment um, and individuals will decide to save rather than consume, all of which will hold back the normal sets of activities that we see in the economy. So in fact, what government's response has been, and it's done this to a great extent, but not completely, is to create the conditions under which when we have these interventions to limit the spread of the virus, the impact on the economy is limited. And that's precisely what the furlough scheme was able to do. That's precisely what the uh, business bounce back scheme was able to do. And that's precisely what the large level of fiscal deficits that we're looking at right now have been able to do as well. They're providing a level of insurance for people who otherwise haven't been able to insure themselves. And what that means is that even though the economy is contracted at a level that none of us have experienced before, and they're very large numbers, um, I just want to say as a caveat, there are some serious issues in the way that health output in particular uh, is measured at the moment by the ONS, certainly underestimating the amount of activity in the health service. And because it's been underestimating the amount of activity in the health and social care service, it has led to a slight exaggeration in the fall in GDP. But before I go on further, I want to say that is probably the case across all sectors. Any of the measurements that we have in terms of GDP are preliminary. 
They're on the basis of surveys that are incomplete. And they're across all the sectors of the economy, which has been tremendous churn this year as people have moved from one sector to the other. And that just increases the concern that I have in any of the numbers that we're seeing. But even if we start to play with the numbers, what we can agree upon is that the size of the shock is incredibly large. And so what we really wanted from economic policy are statements that mean that when we have more targeted interventions in the economy to limit the spread of the virus, the impact on the economy is to some extent attenuated. And you do that with much more clarity than we've had. One particularly good example, I think, is the furlough scheme itself. Now it's been extended to March 2021. Um, it was introduced and welcome as an introduction in the budget in the spring, but far too quickly the government sought to move away from it uh, in the July statement. And what that then led to was a period of uncertainty with firms not taking on employees or laying people off or making them redundant because they thought the furlough scheme was about to end. It was only when the pressure of that was so enormous, the government decided to change its mind and extend the furlough scheme. So even though when the history books are written, it's gonna look as though the furlough scheme was in existence for a year, its impact was less than it would otherwise have been because of the vacillations in government policy. And that is how government has been adding to uncertainty with the, not adopting very clear frameworks of support at, at many, many points throughout this year. Another good example with the prevarication over the firebreak lockdown. I had a lot of analysis that it was very likely there was going to be a further uh, uh, peak in the spread of the virus in the autumn. Um, that was reasonably clear and therefore one could have had a coordinated lockdown uh, as a firebreak during the school holidays that would have been more powerful than a later one. The non-linearity of the way that the virus spreads means that prompt early action is much more effective than waiting. Uh, so the longer you wait, the longer you have to have lockdowns and the more lives you lost. We've done some work from March suggesting that if we'd gone into a lockdown even a week earlier, the rate of infections would have halved compared to what we otherwise would have seen. That's not necessarily the case now because we've got social distancing in place. We've learned some lessons, but clearly by acting promptly, we would have had a better response. So I want to sort of put that together as, as we need an economic framework that deals with the long run and acts promptly to things that have come along. Uh, and where that matters as well is, is if we look into the longer run, if we accept that public sector is not competing for funds with the private sector, it's often supporting private sector activity, whether it's education or health or other areas. And if we look at one of the things in the OBR that thankfully Chris didn't mention, I was able to say something, uh, is that um, if we look at government revenues in the medium to long run, they're about 38% of GDP and expenditures around 42% of GDP. Now, the long run history of government expenditure, total managed expenditure is around 40% of GDP in the post-war period. And again, it's hard to sort of be absolutely clear as to what the scientific value of that should be. But if we accept all the arguments that I've made is we have to have a resilient healthcare service, we have to have better levels of human capital accumulation. That means that we're probably going to continue to spend at that level. That means at some point we're going to have to think about how we increase revenues. But the key thing is right now we don't have to worry about it. Interest rates are at zero and we have time to plan accordingly in the way that we might want. But where we want to direct that investment if we can, if I get to my final two points and I'll stop. Is, is to recognize that there is a huge capital gap in the country, physical, human, and intangible. The, all the measures of capital to output ratios have been falling since the 1980s. And that aggregate fall is very much the thing that explains the regional inequalities that we see. The high value firms that we have in the country are, are mostly concentrated in London and the Southeast, IT, um, uh, finance, pharma, um, and the low productivity firms are spread otherwise around the country. The low productivity firms are essentially low productivity firms because they're operating with low levels of human and physical capital. And we need mechanisms to increase those capital in the economy. There was a talk of a national infrastructure bank that might help, but there's been very little detail. To be honest, four billion pounds, which is the number that was talked about last week, I haven't seen any detail on it at all, is of course a lot of money to us, but is very little money in terms of a gap that is increasing in terms of capital. Finally, we talk about regional um, and uh, other types of inequalities. 
we've got to worry about the shock. Most of us on this call have been very lucky. We live, we work in high human capital sectors that have been mostly able to continue online. Those who've had their jobs and livelihoods affected meant that the shock has been very unequal. And we've been looking in particular at the increase in destitution. That means those people living on less than 70 pounds a week and our reasonable forecasts, which are in line with those of the OBR, suggest that's going to at least double in our, on aggregate across the country over the course of next year with very large amounts of regional inequality. And we know destitution is linked to homelessness, is linked to um, health, uh, or, or lack of health or other kinds of social ills that we might see and we absolutely need those things to be addressed as well by any future policies but I unfortunately saw precious little of that last week in the spending review. Thank you. Thank you very much Ajit and I think one big theme of what you was of the many things you said was the short-termism and how to overcome that and have to have a more holistic um, fiscal or indeed economic strategy going forwards and I know there have been some questions on that which we'll return to in the discussion if that's okay. Um, so now let's turn to Anita who's going to give us the view particularly on um, the NHS and social care, the implications of the spending review for funding of those services given the squeeze that Giles and um, that Chris and Jadjit uh, mentioned. Yeah uh, so I guess uh, in, in the spending review when we look at the NHS and social care we think the Chancellor had um, three real uh, jobs to do. One unambiguously was to meet the costs, the health costs of COVID-19 now, because if we scrimp on those, we compound the health uh, shock and we compound the economic shock. And I think he got that and clearly understood that. And so um, he confirmed that we'd spend, are likely to spend 50 billion, I'll say that again, 50 billion pounds uh, this year on the health costs. That is covering things like the test and trace system, the extra costs of PPE, uh, beginning the vaccine uh, procurement system and some support into the health service some capital to reconfigure services so they can be, we can have more social distancing and infection control. He set aside £20 billion for more of that next year, so 70 odd billion over the two years, but was very clear that if the NHS and the health system needs more to meet that direct cost of COVID-19, it will be forthcoming. So that budget isn't capped. To put that in context then, if you spread that over the two years, the health costs are coming at about 2% of GDP in normal times. Against the sort of economic shock that Chris and Judge have uh, spelt out, it's clearly, although that's a huge amount of money, yeah, it would be a much bigger hit to our finances if we didn't spend that. So that's, uh, that's very important. That's really important. It's really important that he funds the cost in the NHS for COVID, but it's also really important that he funds the cost in social care system. You know, a huge proportion of the deaths from COVID-19 have been in social care and they also need the support. And there's much less trumpeting of that. It's really critical that that reaches local government and from local government out to social care providers. But the second job he had to do was to be to fund the health service recovery and the social care recovery as well. And here, I think it's clear that he made a little start, a small start, a tentative start, but not didn't really provide uh, a convincing response to that. And um, one of the things that is really clear from COVID-19 is we, we went into this with some real fragility in our health service and our social care system that have made it harder for us compared to many other countries to weather the storm, despite the fact that we have a free at point of use, comprehensive healthcare system. So we run our system incredibly hot with low physical capacity, with low capacity in terms of the numbers of doctors, the number of nurses. We went into this with shortages and in the social care system, we went into this with a lot of frailties particularly about the way we staff the social care system and research that it's emerging through COVID is showing that some of our staffing model have a high reliance on temporary staff, on zero hours contracts, of moving staff around. 
um, is associated, we don't know causality yet, but from the work today, is associated with higher rates of, of, of transmission than bigger outbreaks. So um, that model of running your system really hot and that fragility left off exposed. In the NHS, what it meant we had to do was shut down a huge amount of wider health services in order to accommodate COVID. Yeah? So practical things, it does look like hospitals which had, for example, more single bedrooms are, were more resilient than hospitals that still got people in old fashioned bays. I mean, in an infection disease, it's kind of obvious, you know, but that's a sort of source of issue that seems to make you more exposed. Anyway, so whilst he set aside over £70 billion uh, in, in, over these two years for COVID, only £3 billion of that is really for the beginnings of recovery. And we estimate, and you know, it's really difficult to be precise on all of this at the moment, uncertainty is high, but actually on some really quite cautious assumptions, we estimate the cost next year of beginning to recover is about 10 billion. They're about the backlog of unmet care needs from waiting, beginning to meet the uh, mental health impact that is already coming through. He set aside half a, uh, half a billion pounds, 500 million pounds next year. It's more like 2 billion that we reckon that, uh, is needed for that. And then the NHS can't operate services as normal. Yeah? The requirements for infectious control and social distancing have a big impact on the way hospitals operate. Again, he gave a little bit of money for that, but nothing near the amount that we, we, we'd be needing. So there are question marks it, it, uh, next year uh, about whether or not he's resourced the NHS to recover. And in social care, it was absolute sticking plaster, as, as Chris has, ha, has said, and nothing really on the workforce. In addition to that, though, I think he had a real opportunity and he needs next year to really address this, to really start to think about some of those underlying fault lines. So there is very little in this spending review to expand numbers in training for, for the health service. And, you know, that cavalry won't arrive quickly. We should have been spending on that a decade ago. But if you weren't spending on that a decade ago, the second best time to start spending is now. Yeah. And actually, this is one where the health service could be part of the win-win because, you know, jobs in healthcare are part of good quality jobs in communities across the country. So, you know, some of the economic scarring that will come from this crisis is lost opportunities for a generation of young people. Health and social care could be part of that solution. And, uh, and we need to invest now. There has been an increase in numbers this year with all the fiasco over A-levels. We need to make sure that's not a one-off blip and a sustained increase in the numbers trading in all the jobs that are available in health and social care at graduate level, but also critically in things like apprenticeships and um, lower level qualifications that provide uh, a routine. We need investment in capital infrastructure, so we're not so capacity constrained. And then the third area we need is investment in our public health uh, infrastructure. We saw, you know, if spending on public health in real terms has fallen by a quarter since 2013-14. Uh, and again, that is one of the examples where cutting costs is actually not supportive of your long run challenge to be efficient and effective. Uh, and we need to reverse that and, and really focus that spending on the communities that need it. And then finally, the legacy of this crisis must be that we really do address the, uh, the, 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 the missed plank of our welfare state and put right the myriad of problems in, in social care. So, you know, <clears throat> nine out of 10, maybe on funding COVID, but nowhere near that on these underlying and longer term issues. Thank you. I mean, I, that, that leads me to, I think the first, uh, I think you probably answered this question, but if, um, you know, the, the, when you read, um, the financial papers and you read the uh, what the IFS are putting out, they sort of say, well, the, the, the government have probably got two or three years where it can continue to spend. 
uh, after that, which there needs to be some um, reckoning with either tax rises, cutting back spending, or somehow increasing borrowing, I don't know. Um, in those to that two to three year window, which is political window that's important as well, given the, the, when the next election is, um, I suppose um, the, the question is, 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 can they, and do they have the bandwidth, or indeed the political complexion, to be able to set out some long-term sort of spending that is going to set us on the right path. So beyond sticking plaster for COVID and really address some more deep-seated issues is what I'm getting at. And there may be a shortish window of, of that uh, before the long run into the, ne into the next election. Um, so what's your, all of your feelings about the extent to which, A, they've got the bandwidth to think about this build back better beyond a few hospitals and transportation links. Um, and even if they did have the mental then bandwidth to, to, to do this, how much um, money would they have it re realistically to be able to, um, to, to effect such a strategy or begin to effect such a strategy even over the next few, few years, let alone the long term. So maybe I'll start off with Chris on that. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, big question. Do, do they have the bandwidth? Well, I, I mean, I think we don't know yet is the honest answer. We don't know what this government actually really wants to do, apart from quite a lot of slogans about levelling up, and making the world a much better place and not talking about trade-offs at all and we won't increase taxes, we won't have austerity, we will level up all these things where, and not making any choices. So I think, I think uh, they do need to sort of start to think about what are, are the difficult questions. Uh, there is definitely scope I think now that we are hopefully through the worst of the crisis so if we're not going to have a third wave or we keep things under control and we can start to see we're on a recovery process and that is exactly when you want to put a longer term plan in there. We have sufficient capital uh, budgets, I think. Uh, we're gonna, we have generous capital budgets for the next five years already put in place. So that, that was in, even in March. So that, that, the, that, that sort of money is there and they're, they're historically high for the UK. So I don't think there's a particular problem on capital. I think what Anita was talking about, making choices about resilience in the health service is a really big one. It's not always obviously the case that you want to have gold-plated, totally resilient um, health service for the economy. That if you're only going to get a pandemic once every hundred years or so, then you might want to run hot. But that's a question. That's actually a strat strategic question you want to look at and actually decide. Because we know that we've been hit really hard. So we know that we've been hit really hard in this crisis because our health service we were running it so hot. And when you run something that hot, then the last thing you want to do is take decisions on things like lockdowns late, as, as Jagjit said. Because if you know that you've got no spare capacity, you've got to really protect the capacity you've got. So so we took we we had a a longer term strategic position of hot, not much spare capacity. And then we had a political decision not to therefore say, right, we need to be super careful in the, in the, in the face of a global pandemic, which was a, a double mistake. And that's why we, I think we've had the, big, the, the economic hit that we've had in this country. So we've got time, it's difficult. We have to think about our fiscal position quite hard. Uh, it's not, it's not great, but it's not disastrous. I, want, I think we should stress that. And we can certainly afford it. We are still a rich, advanced economy and we can afford it. These are choices we have to make, not disasters that we are facing. Thank you. Um, I, I, I question um, whether there is a bandwidth. Um, Chris, as Chris says, I think we have the capacity, but whether the the current policymakers we have are focused on these questions is something I question from the performance of this year. One could be optimistic and hope that lessons have been learned, but I think what we need are institutions or frameworks that go beyond the immediate length of any given parliament. Um, we've had a, a decade of fiscal rules that have been pinned down by to the length of the political cycle. Actually, economic shocks and economic shortfalls and levelling up it go far beyond any political cycle. So we need mechanisms to ensure that policymakers think about the longer run. And you want to add on to that, the fact that uh, uh, one other thing I wanted to say in my opening remarks, but for some reason I forgot, probably because I'm trying not to think about it too much, uh, Brexit. 
<laughs> is itself something that is reducing bandwidth. It's something that is, is, is going to continue to occupy the minds of policymakers as it has since the referendum and we, as it will continue to do so, even if we have some form of deal with the European Union, as we all know, and we're rehearsing for the last four or five years, that will occupy a lot of bandwidth as we have to get deals together for other countries with which we trade. The UK is one of the most open economies in the world and has a very high economist jargon coming up, beta with global growth. You know, the UK tends to move equi-proportionally with global growth. We're very sensitive to global shocks. So that's something that needs to be managed. And we know all of these trade negotiations are, are themselves tortuous and will take time and bandwidth. So what we need to do is think about what kind of economic framework or institutions we have so that these things can be properly monitored over the medium term. And one technical thing we might move towards, whether we've got enough public investment in certain areas or not, it's a moot point. The question is how do we make those decisions? How do we decide what's so, most socially valuable? We're looking at a new green book today that may do a better job it may not do a better job we need ways of monitoring and screening potential projects and ensuring they get carried out if we think they're in the social um, social good and one thing that might help there is moving to whole of government accounts so we look at the whole of the asset and liability positions so that bits of government expenditure that build up our net worth do not look as damaging to the fiscal position as just bits of expenditure that don't and I think all of that would be a much more grown up and mature way to run economic policy. I'd love it if we went there. Um, I'm not convinced today that we will. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we had the previous webinar a few weeks ago and it was all about um, why doesn't government think more fully for the long term? It's actually two aspects. One is why does it think short term and not long term? And the second thing, why, do, why is thinking done in silos anyway and not comprehensive enough? It's those two, two big things. And there are as we know, formidable obstacles to thinking in the long term. Um, but I was just going to turn to Anita because you're obviously director of the new real centre that is trying to plan for the long term, at least to provide the quantitative evidence to support policy making. Um, what do you see in the health world um, that could be setting us onto a good path for the future in the next couple of years that isn't that is beyond um, coping with the aftermath? So I guess uh, there are a couple of things coming out of this that we should be positive about. Um, as as work at colleague, colleagues at the Health Foundation have shown, this has fast-tracked an enormous amount of innovation in the way that we deliver healthcare, um, which if we can then move from, if you like, field hospital mode of operation and, and actually uh, develop into our normal way of practice will improve the health, way our healthcare system works and potentially drive some productivity gain. So we've harnessed the power of digital very obviously uh, it, it, uh, through, through, through this uh, crisis uh, and we need to do more of that and I think that, you know there is a, a kind of appetite there, I mean people are absolutely exhausted um, but, but I think it has changed the appetite to innovate and to try new things and it's broken down a lot of boundaries between different staff groups and as staff costs are a big part of what we do you know being able to to think more creatively about the way we work in the teams I think it's also if I'm wearing my optimistic hat for a moment I, th I think it has raised national consciousness about social care and the vital importance of social care uh, and what people who work in social care uh, do and the vital contribution that they make and you know they are one of the groups in the workforce who in their mortality have paid one of the biggest prices of, of Covid and I, I hope and I think it, you know it, it might be that that, that, that that this does increase the chance that finally you know a government um, will find the bandwidth to, um, to make good uh, on social care. The third area where if you were being optimistic you could say is I think this crisis has shown us that resilience comes not just from the physical capacity in the system but also the health stock of our population. So you know obesity is one of the big factors which has contributed to a higher mortality burden from COVID-19 and we have uh, in the UK very high obesity rates 
Now, if we were thinking about how to try to create a more resilient society to any sort of health shock, tackling obesity is unambiguously in the win-win. You know, if, if we have another pandemic in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, actually having less obesity in our society will deliver benefits whose payoff, if we look at this in the classic kind of cost effectiveness of healthcare interventions, is already up there in the, at, at the highest level. So that, that would be great, you know, under any scenario. And we've systematically underinvested in that health prevention, both in the local public health uh, work, but also in public policy. You did a fantastic podcast with Dame Sally Davis and Harry Rutter. Uh, um, and actually the failure to, the, the, the fear of the nanny state and the failure to implement policies which very clearly deliver huge health pay off is one of the things, again, that you'd hope would be very different out of, out of this crisis. Thank you. I mean, I think um, a lot of our conversation has been about what government can do, what it should do, what it's able to do. Um, but yet, I think this crisis hasn't it shown that the, the centre, Whitehall, is just um, limited in its capacity to be able to think about these issues and it's far away from things on the ground and that goes for the NHS as well, NHS Central, wasn't it, NHS England. Um, I noticed in the Conservative Manifesto, which seems a long time ago, just before the election, they did talk about making progress on devolution within England to local government. So the question I guess for you all is if the centre is just too small to be able to cope with some of these bigger issues, what agency and what scope is there for local government to be able to solve some of these issues, um, understanding that the pipes of funds come largely from central government, but nevertheless, is this something that we should be building up as part of our resilience uh, in future to be able to crowdsource more ideas, get more leadership, and understand a lot more the granularity of what needs to happen locally with respect to public investment. So Chris, can I talk to, turn to you first on that? Well, I think the short answer, Jennifer, is yes. <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's yes that we certainly, to have a more resilient economy and health uh, provision, then we would want to have local government being much stronger than it is today. And I think that's also one of the, the key things in terms of levelling up we want local authorities not to be just recipients of central government money with very little power. We want them to be taking decisions and some of them failing and some of them succeeding and having some more competition between powerful local authorities. I think we're, we've seen countries similar to us who've done well, and I'll say Germany and Korea as two obvious examples that definitively takes place. I'm not hugely confident that that will necessarily be the outcome of this crisis. And I think the tier system negotiations between central government and local government hasn't left central government feeling that what they really want is powerful local leaders who have a, have a chance to challenge them. Uh, and so I'm, I've got to say I'm rather pessimistic and I have a feeling that we're going to move back into the central government having the power. They like local government so long as local government is nice and supplicant and just waiting for a check from them. Thank you. And there's also the the pertinent issue about the amount of money going into local government at the moment and the amount that they can raise. Judge it, I'm sure you'll have a view on this. Well, I think very briefly, I, 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 it, it would be a nice position to be in if we had responsible local um, authorities, perhaps with their own local taxes, with a revaluation of, of uh, house prices and council taxes proportional to that. Um, and we participated in local elections in the same, in the same degree we did nationally and held people to account um, for their decisions in a way that we try to do nationally as well. And I think that would be an important part of spreading. I talked earlier on about high productivity firms across the country. These are plants that need to be built up over time. They would also provide regional areas of strong demand so that there's, no, not, there's more than one focal point for high human capital people in the country. It's really important that there are different parts of the country they might move to. Of course, a lot of that is connected with universities, but a lot of it can be connected with the development of high value firms around the country. That's going to require quite a long period again of, of developing those links with the politics um, and the firms that, that are growing up as well as a regional sense of identity. You can see some of it growing. Clearly, 
the devolved nations. It's been growing very quickly, but one can see in parts of Yorkshire and the Northeast that happening as well. It, it would be nice if this crisis could move us further in that direction. But I, I think the idea that the man or woman at Whitehall knows best is so ingrained in the way that we run things here, it may require quite a sustained effort for that to be changed. But I, I, it would be a better solution because, you know, the obvious example, when we went into lockdown in March, if all the local authorities knew exactly where all the potholes were, they could have gone out and filled them all. But they didn't. There was no one around with that bit of information. And that would have been quite a smart thing to do. We don't have that. So building that up again, I'm afraid it's a bit of a Lee motif for me today, is again another long-term agenda, but a good one to, to get involved with. Thank you. And Anita, the dynamics in health is, you know, obviously in, in, in the grip of a COVID pandemic, the centre had to make some big decisions, which it did, but then it also allowed some autonomy locally. And we saw some fantastic things happen, didn't we? Particularly across areas, indeed, where there was more devolution, for example, in Greater Manchester, um, despite the fact they had a disease load, high disease load there. Yes, um, I think we've also seen, and, and, and people across the NHS have reported, the areas that did manage to do uh, a bit better with the uh, the pressures of the pandemic were areas where they had very strong uh, legacies of working across their system. So between different um, hospitals and parts of the healthcare system, but critically with local government, they had good platforms of shared data that they were able to mobilise quickly. Because you know, in the classic analogy, you know, other parts of the country were trying to build the plane while flying it. You, know, you wanted to be in a geography where you'd built that and you had the, um, the um, physical links, uh, but also the relationship links. One of the things that is potentially a legacy of this crisis though in healthcare is it does look like we're going to get an NHS bill, which is going to reform some of the structures in, in the NHS, um, abolish the, some elements of the 2012 Act uh, and replace those with a stronger tier which is, so we've had in the, in the health service for what, what, 30 years a move to a more competitive and market-based system with strong independent hospitals and then these commissioners. And we've, we've played around with what commissioners are, look like se several times. They want to create a stronger place-based unit that brings together all of the providers in a locality and at a slightly bigger geography. And I think one of the interesting things that we haven't talked about in, in the geographical debate is there's national government and then local government. Many other countries have a stronger regional tier. <clears throat> and some of the things that we've been talking about, and I guess in Devo Bank, actually what we've seen is the creation of a stronger regional tier. Um, people never loved in the health service their regions, but they are slightly mourning the loss of it. The constant debate about what's the right level of geography uh, uh, remains. But, but I think they're talking about an act in, uh, in place for 2022 now. So that will be a legacy of, of COVID-19. Thank you. So there's some, a couple of questions on this particular issue. Clearly, if there is a moment of reckoning, um, which will begin in say two to three years time, whether that's cutbacks or tax rises or both, um, there is a big issue when looking at the health sector, given the amount of public spending it takes up to have a renewed look at productivity in the health sector. And um, so I think the question there is, you know, what kinds of approaches, I think this is probably a neater, but it, it might also be Chris and judge it with respect to the wider economy, which probably doesn't have a great story to tell vis-a-vis -vis producti productivity growth. Um, where do you think the big gains might be for any spare investment now to try and up the productivity of the NHS? In, in other words, to do more with the same amount of money, given the amount of public spending and the share of the pie that goes into the NHS? Yeah. Like, Anita first, and then maybe I'll turn to Chris and judge it in case there's anything that you might want to say with respect to the wider economy and investments now. Yeah, there's capital sloshing around, as Chris says. Yeah, so uh, so I think I'd highlight uh, three things that seem really important. One is, you know, for at least thirty years, we've had an ambition to move some of our money upstream in the uh, it, away from crisis healthcare towards earlier diagnosis and and prevention, where we fall short. 
um, on international comparisons, it's of, often as a, uh, a product of, of a fat. Um, and yet what we end up doing always is spending on the rescue uh, element. So getting that right, finally, you know, uh, uh, making that, that change, uh, um, which is the ambition of policy even now in the NHS long-term plan, that'd be an important thing. Um, we do potentially have had a breakthrough moment on uh, digital and new technology. Um, and we need to harness that and maximize that. In that sense, you know, health, in, in a way, what I'm describing is health is not that different to uh, to the wider economy. It manifests itself in a different way, but you know, harnessing that, that the power of that technology. That's the direct digital technology in terms of um, being able to do all the uh, remote consultations and, uh, and, and all the, 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 those things. But it's also, as we've seen now, the power of AI and the big data that we, we have and really mobilizing that. And then the third thing is, you know, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, never, as ever, it's the workforce stupid. You know, so the big part of the cost and the huge part of the quality in healthcare is our workforce. Um, I think perversely, we've been a focused on cost and not focused on efficiency for too long. And we have run our system by under trading um, and we've been fearful of oversupply. And I think actually that's led to an enormous hidden cost. The other thing we've done is we've we've actually hugely increased the number of very specialist doctors and not invested in our nurses and in our generalists to the same extent. That doesn't look very sensible, I think, in terms of the overall efficiency and doesn't look very sensible in terms of the changing pattern of need. So that, again, I think could unlock some, some gains. So, you know, digital people uh, as well and move it upstream. Thank you so much. And I've just looked in horror at the time, so we're really almost out of time. So I don't know whether if I can ask Chris and Jadget to to maybe give 30 seconds to the very large subject of productivity. If there's anything that you particularly want to say, particularly on capital investment that might boost this in the wider economy. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll say two things. What we, we know where our productivity problem is in the UK. We have two problems. One is that our most productive and best companies haven't been improving their productivity as fast as they were in the 90s and early 2000s. And the second is that we have a very long tail of pretty uh, unproductive companies uh, across the UK. I think government policy is not very suited to the first, and that's really a global problem, not really a, a, a UK specific problem. But the second really is a problem. And I think there it's it's mostly a skills issue we, a little bit we solve by this jolt to digitization that we've seen in this crisis so that could be a good thing coming out of the crisis but we have a bad record in the uk on but we have we're very good at top end skills we're not very good at middle and low skills and that is a Thank you. And Judge it, sorry, we've probably literally got about 30 seconds. And we're going well, to I won't take more. I simply so agree with everything that Nita and Chris have said. I think what we do need, though, is better measurement. The way we measure inputs and outputs in the health sector are severely uh, misleading, particularly at the moment. And I would, I would like a clearer analysis of, of productivity across the service sector. There are many problems in the way that we measure it, even in the financial sector, uh, but particularly in the health sector, that I think is distorting the huge effort that the health sector has put in this year. And I would like to start from that first, you know, where exactly are we? How are these productivity measures constructed? And that would give us a better uh, guide, I think, as to how to improve them. It's not really where I'd like to focus. I'd very much like to focus on outputs as well than just the ratio of outputs to inputs, which is productivity. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, I've kept well that. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you all to all of you who are listening today and taking part and, and submitting questions. And thanks in particular to our fantastic panelists, Chris Giles, Jajit Chadra and Anita Charlesworth. We only scratched the surface, didn't we? But please join us in future. We'll be returning. This one is going to run and run. All your um, cleverness, all your questions will be very, very helpful as we try and probe and get through the fog in the future. But many, many thanks and hopefully you can join us again. Thank you.